So when I, before I preach, I go over and over and read it for a week or two or three sometimes, the scripture. And as I reflected on it, I was like, the amazing teachings of Jesus is what came up to me. And then what also came up is a lot of us need to either learn and or relearn what we did learn growing up about Jesus. But I do love the statement that um, what Jesus taught affected them in ways that their own teachers couldn't. And before we go into what um, any new teachings or old teachings that need to be retaught, made me reflect on my own teachers growing up. So when I was in kindergarten, Mrs. Janicki would not give me a Band-Aid for my finger when we were watching a movie because I had pulled on a little hang skin and there was a little bit of blood and she said it was my fault, so she wouldn't give me a, a Band-Aid. I didn't think that was a very nice lesson, but that's one that has stuck with me all these years. Mrs. Smith in first grade, she loved the writing of the stories that I did and she encouraged me to keep writing. Now that affected me positively. Uh, Mrs. Maupin in fifth grade, she had a lovely warm smile, but she was older than the saying says, older than dirt, you know. Well, if I look back on that now, she was probably maybe 55 because when you're young, everybody, you know, older people all look very old. So she's not, probably was not really that old. And then Mr. Nusir was my first male teacher in sixth grade, and he loved to tease everybody. I didn't like that. That creeped me out. So he wasn't my favorite. But in middle school, my favorite, one of my favorites was my sewing teacher, Mrs. Fawcett. My mom had already taught me to sew. So I was able to do my own projects and not have to do the simple little projects that the other kids were doing. And her encouragement of me was always lovely. It was, felt great. Now my high school teachers weren't memorable because I was just an average student and I just plotted right through. But spiritual teachers, that's a different story. Some of you have heard this story before, but this teacher was actually a picture on the wall in my Sunday school classroom. I was probably in third or fourth grade. And I don't remember the teacher or the children in the class, but as you walked in the room, directly on the other side was a portrait of Jesus. And it's the typical one that most of us have seen probably for the last 50 or 60 years of Jesus' face up close is looking very solemn. That picture stuck in my mind and still sticks in my mind. I can still see it. The importance of Jesus in my life, that's where it started. I think right there. And I kind of wonder sometimes whether that was the beginning of my call to ministry, knowing the important importance of Jesus. Just an interesting thought that I will never have a, you know, know about. Um, another of my persons that was in the, once I followed my first call to ministry and that I ignored for many years, but when I did step into it, my mentor here was Pastor Susie Smith. For those of you who did not know Susie, she was beloved by, I would venture to say, just about everyone. She listened intently to every question and made you feel like you were the only one in the room. She didn't just give you an answer to your question straight up. She made you think about it. She offered another way to look at something. She offered valuable teaching. And she helped me to connect what I had been mulling over in my head with my heart. So then I could put those thoughts back out into the universe in a helpful and constructive manner. Then there was my friend, Margaret, an older woman who has since passed. We sat in many Bible studies together, and I loved the way she prayed. She was always very deliberate and very slow, but it was beautiful. Her life teachings affected me and who I was becoming. There were many teachers of the classes I took on my way through ministry, and most of them were delightful. With special admiration as to Reverend Wanda Craner, who was on the Pennsylvania Southeast Conference um, staff for many years as the Minister of Spiritual Nurture, and then she was acting conference minister for a while. Her growth, growth brought her to become a Gestalt pastoral care minister and spiritual director. She was a joy-filled, loving and compassionate woman and teacher who could simply fill a room with her loving energy. She unfortunately passed away earlier this year. Memories are wonderful like that just sometimes to draw them up. So I invite you to take some time later and reflect on the teachers in your life that affected your upbringing. 
Besides the teachings of Jesus, see if there was anyone amazing amongst them. Now, I've asked several of our friends to share a thought or two about what they've learned from the amazing teachings of Jesus. But first, my friend Nancy Garrett, who many of you know, shared that to her, Jesus was a prayer warrior. She said, I don't like to speak in terms of battle and war, but warrior in this context, I feel, applies. Jesus was disciplined as any military soldier. His time in prayer kept him focused and not distracted by the noise of those trying to distract and defeat him. Jesus' prayer time was not something he did only when it was convenient. He often prayed deep into the night because it was necessary. He stayed focused and determined, not by some battle cry, but through prayer that led him to know his mission. His followers knew where to find Jesus because they knew he would be in prayer. Jesus did not speak many prayers when he was with others. Rather, his actions were the result of his prayer life. You could say he lived outward from prayer, prayer being what made him who he was. When I come across lists for self-improvement or articles about ways to distress and center your life, these two things are almost always there. Find time for yourself, to be alone, followed by finding some time to be silent and listen. If you want to live from your heart and your core beliefs, find time first to pray before you go out into the world. So thank you, Nancy, for sharing that. And my friend, Ellen. Ellen said that she's always interested in Christ's relationship with women and the Jewish laws about interactions between men and women. Now, both of those were progressive concepts and not readily accepted practices during the lifetime of Jesus. So there is a lot of interesting things there. One of the amazing teachings that I appreciate came from John Canis. John said that Jesus told his disciples that they also could do what he was doing. Therefore, his message was one of empowerment. And the recognition of our spiritual self is the direct route to our own empowerment. He was showing us the way to spiritual salvation from the human condition. Here's another progressively powerful statement from John. He said, Jesus, the man, was mortal and in the context of his mortality was not part of the divine trinity. Christ, the spirit of Jesus, is fully spiritual and eternal and fully of God's essence. I think that's another really deep one. Now, I have asked, like I said, I've asked a few people if they would like to share something. Is there anyone here that would like to share their thoughts on Jesus, what they might have wished they had learned or changed their thinking? Anyone online? Charlene, lovely. We have to admit, sorry. So I thought about this, Michelle, after you emailed, and it will be quite so profound, but what occurred to me was that Having grown up in the church, Jesus was either a baby uh, or that he was someone who was crucified and died for our sins. And that whole in the middle part, and I don't want to disparage any of my 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 uh, my Bible school teachers. I'm sure they talked about that middle part, but I just grew up with those two. The, the, the beginning and the end. And it was only until much later in life that I began to appreciate Jesus as fully human and that he had to navigate so many of the same things that we deal with even today in political environments. And learning more about how Jesus walked as a human has been very interesting for me. Thank you, Charlene. Would anyone else here like to share something that they've thought about that they wish they knew or something new that they've learned okay yeah. yes yes good uh well yeah and this is more based on more recent reflection and based on the way um uh christianity is presenting itself these days. I kind of wish that the image of Jesus 
wasn't always blue eyes, white skin. Mm -hmm. okay. yep. Thank you, Bill. Okay, if there are no others, I'll continue. Thank you very much. This morning's scripture came from the first book in the Gospel of Mark. And I don't know whether you realize that he shares nothing about Jesus' birth story. And Charlene kind of mentioned that. We just heard about the birth, and then he, Mark jumps right into the telling, the beginning of his public ministry. It's the time right after Jesus has chosen his first four disciples, and then he sat right down in the synagogue and started teaching. And isn't it also interesting that he's sitting in the synagogue teaching? Because that is what they did. The mysterious Jesus arrives as a humble, kind, and yet kingly presence. Mark describes the people who are drawn toward Jesus as regular people who have become affected by the character, passion, and light of this strange Galilean. And yet, working preacher noted that Jesus' authority was a contested authority. His presence, his words, and deeds threatened the other forces that claimed authority over people's lives. These other authorities had something to lose. Jesus, by just his sheer presence in the synagogue, had upset the order. He had crossed an established boundary. That is, he interprets the law and speaks on behalf of God without engaging in much dialogue about traditions, as the scribes were known to do. Now, the teaching and the exorcism are connected then, since both result in amazement and acclamations about Jesus' authority. Teaching and exorcism both have immediate effects, and both issue claims about who Jesus is. Inquiries into Jesus' authority are inquiries into his identity. Reverend Dr. Myers, she spoke to the importance of our questioning of our faith and our lifelong learning. For example, she said slavery is embraced in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and never repudiated. Women are second-class humans in scripture, the property of their fathers until they become the property of their husbands. Disease was thought to be caused by demon possession, and humans lived in what they believed was a three-story universe, heaven above, the abyss below, and then the you and me in the middle. The earth was thought to be the center of the universe, and humans were thought to be the unique and crowning creation of a doting God was only because we continue to grow and learn as human beings that slavery is now universally condemned. It's only because we understand the injustice of treating human beings differently based on gender that we have made progress when it comes to equal rights for women and LGBTQIA plus people. It's only because we discovered and studied microorganisms that we now recognize the real cause of disease. It was only because we have learned to study the heavens that we've discovered an infinite universe where other life is likely to exist. And we know that the earth is not the center of the universe or even, even our own solar system. Many people no longer believe in God as a person who dwells above the world and the clouds, but as love's transcendent mystery, the one beyond naming or knowing. We know about evil in the world, but many of us do not believe in the devil as an independent contractor of evil. It's not because we stopped being certain of things, but because we became certain of new things. Who's to say that God is not beside, behind such an evolution? Who is to say that the model of faith is not to question everything and see what remains to serve the purposes of love? It is all about love. And lifelong learning does not eliminate certainty, but it sharpens it. I believe that love is better than hate and peace is better than war because life is better than death. Of this, I am certain. I also know how much I don't know and will never know. So instead of faith as certainty, I prefer to think of faith as trust. And as my congregational predecessors like to put it, there is yet more light to break forth from God's holy word. It's the end of her quote. Pennsylvania Southeast Conference Minister Reverend Bill Worley recently shared of the legacy and teaching of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He said that Dr. King had a visionary's gift 
for discerning the right direction and turning the nation towards it, blending faith with action. He never ceased to see the better side in those who disagreed with him, and he opposed force with love. He said, just keep loving them, and they can't stand it for too long. That was and is his great guidance for leaders of conflicted countries and congregations. Resolving any challenge moves people on the problem itself to a focus on transforming the relationship that holds the problem in place. That's the difficult path of Jesus, and it's the one that we, the disciples of Christ, are called to follow. The world is crying out for that kind of relational transformational witness. It's our call to make sure that they have it. And that's the end of his quote. Where are we still amazed by Jesus' authority? By his teachings and deeds potential to upend our assumptions about what's possible? Where can we see souls set free from destructive tendencies and powers that we thought were beyond anyone's control? Of Jesus' greatness on the gospel's power? I believe. It's about discovering what deserves our amazement in our current and longed for experiences. Matthew 5.20 declares that what God demands of us goes far beyond what the scribes suggest. How different from Jesus' concept of power and authority is our politics? Our politicians sometimes try to manipulate us. They say one thing and they do another. They use their authority for self-aggrandizement. They look for short-term gain, even if that means doing the wrong thing, rather than doing the right thing and trusting that in the long term, history, not to mention God, may vindicate them. Will the future be any different? We are all lifelong learners and each at different stages of our spiritual journeys. We often get referred to as followers of Jesus. And I read the other day where someone referred to us as apprentices to Jesus rather than followers. To me, apprentices are continually learning and perfecting their trade or skill until they get it right. Have we achieved being a follower of Jesus or an apprentice to Jesus? Again, we're on a lifelong journey, but we're often forced to change all the time with new life situations. Some people who are new to the journey have a need to acquire all the information they can get their hands on. Others are experiencing trauma in their family or death of a beloved and are in need of support and encouragement. Perhaps you're seeking healing of a loved one or for yourself. Perhaps aging is surprising you with new challenges. What we all need, as Reverend Worley stated, are transforming relationships in our lives. And wasn't Jesus about us transforming ourselves to seek to live as a kingdom which had been illustrate, illustrated through the life of Jesus? We need relationships that will heal and love and support one another. Those relationships are being church. Remember, church is the people. It is all of us. Mark depicts Jesus as the one uniquely authorized, commissioned, or empowered to declare and institute the reign of God. Through Jesus, then, we glimpse characteristics of this reign. It's intrusive, breaking old boundaries that benefited another kind of rule. It's about liberating people from the powers that affect them and keep all creation, including human bodies and human societies, from flourishing. It's about articulating God's intentions for the world, defying or reconfiguring some traditions to do so, if need be. The reign of God promises more, whether the more can be realized now or in a far-off future. You are invited to remain an apprentice to Jesus and allow yourself to continually be affected by these teachings in ways that others cannot always touch your spirit. Stay affected by the character the passion, and the light of Jesus. Consider the possibility of a model of faith, of questioning everything, and see what remains to serve the purposes of love. And choose to live on the side of love and hope. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>